Okay, the bulk of today is going to be about the crisis itself. Since an awful lot of newspaper reports and reporters, um, to be polite, haven't a clue what they're talking about. Most newspapers do not have economics reporters. The few that do long ago discovered that they're not enough. And once the crisis hit, when they needed to cover news in a big way, here's what they did. They took reporters who were doing completely other things and threw them into this because this is a hot news story. It's like a disaster, an earthquake or something, except it doesn't go away. So it's not over in three or four days or even a couple of weeks. And that means reporters have been shifted over and I have, I can't tell you how many times I've been on the telephone with a reporter who has no idea and who starts off by asking me some type of reporter question and then for the next 45 minutes basically asks for and usually gets a tutorial to help him or her understand what's going on. I'm not the only one who does that. They call other people. Whoever is kind enough or sucker enough, depending on your point of view, uh, talks to them for 45 minutes or an hour and explains so they can put together the understanding that their superiors somehow imagine they got by osmosis. Um, and so much of the reporting is done by people on a wing and a prayer and half an idea of a part of what might be going on and that's it. So they have to write the article as if they know what they're talking about which means for people like me and I hope after today for you intense laughter that you can enjoy by reading these articles and discovering that they have no idea what they're saying. Which is also why if you read assiduously things like the Wall Street Journal and so forth, you'll see that one article directly contradicts another. That what appears on Tuesday is completely different from what appears on Wednesday. But the person who writes the article on Wednesday doesn't make any comment to the fact that the day before there was an article that said exactly the opposite. Because they can't manage the situation and so they just generate the stories. And they kind of hope that nobody either notices or says anything. And by and large, that's how it goes. That's how it goes. That also creates the space, for those of you that are interested, for a collection of, of chicanery that will go down in history. People on television screaming stock advice to you. I won't mention any names, but you'll know who I'm referring to. And you know, guys develop a persona. They jump up and down and they, they tell you what to buy, what to sell, with the kind of confidence and certainty that only is manageable by people who have no idea what they're doing. Otherwise, they'd have more of that hesitation because they know, they know how many times they misread it, they misunderstood it, and so forth. So if you don't get that, it's run the other direction. And for God's sake, don't follow the advice. If you're lucky enough to have the money, you won't keep it if you do that. Capitalism is a highly unstable system. It is subject to regular and periodic cycles, they tend to be called in economics, business cycles that are characterized by fairly sudden changes in what you might call the normal pattern. The kind of change in which the normal pattern gives way to an upward rise in production, employment, that's such good news for people that we don't worry much about that. The trouble is, almost every time such a thing has happened, it's been followed by the reverse, namely a downturn. And the word crisis, when it gets used, is almost always a reference to such downturns. And by downturn we mean, as the rest of today we'll spend a lot of time on, a sudden drop in production, less goods and services are produced, a drop in employment, people lose their jobs, do less work, and the economy as a whole goes into a kind of contraction in which the loss of jobs and the loss of output damages everybody's income and everybody's economic situation, which then ramifies socially. It affects politics, culture, and everything else in a society, and it affects it in ways that are overwhelmingly negative, hence the word crisis to refer to this situation. It's important to remember that the capitalist system, which is prone to these things over and over again, also has mechanisms for getting out of it. In other words, we're constantly looking at a system that dips down, but then dips back up. And this has led to the tension, you might say, over economic crisis throughout the history of capitalism. We who suffer in the downturns, we who are unemployed, 
we whose businesses go out of existence, go bankrupt, we suffer. So we're right here to tell you something should be done about this. But the suffering is never limited just to those who lose their jobs or those businesses that go out of, out of business. It's everybody else because you are touched by other people. So even if you're not unemployed, your cousin might be, your mother might be, your neighbor might be. And if your cousin, your mother, or your neighbor is affected by unemployment, it will affect you too. The mechanisms of that I'm going to go through a little bit later today. But a crisis affects many people, and even if you're not unemployed, and even if your relatives and neighbors aren't unemployed, you learn about it and you become fearful about it, and that fear and anxiety takes a toll on your employer, takes a toll on you. And so the people who have suffered have been in the forefront of those saying, I don't want an unstable system like this. But of course capitalism as a system has also had its defenders. And the defenders, we went over this, the defenders have come up with their analysis of this instability. Some of them have made it a little bit like nature. In other words, capitalism cycles are a little bit like storms. I mean, we don't like them and it's unpleasant, but it's in the nature of nature and it's to be understood that you know, if it rains, you get an umbrella. You don't scream at the sky for raining and you don't demand that the sky behave otherwise. That would be nutty and to ask that the economy work otherwise is nutty. A great many newspaper stories today are written as though crises, ups and downs are that's just the way it is. Nothing you can do. It's always been like that. Always will be like that. Other people who are defenders don't take that road. They take a different road, if you recall. They find something positive in the cycle and they celebrate that. Remember the story, the firms that go out of business are the inefficient ones. The people who lose their jobs are the unproductive ones. A kind of a self-evident, if you weren't inefficient, you wouldn't have lost the, the, the enterprise. If you weren't unproductive, you wouldn't have been the one laid off, etc., etc. So it becomes a kind of natural selection slash cleansing process. Notice here, this is a struggle over not just how to understand a crisis, but it really is also a struggle in economics about what to do when a crisis hits. And there I want to again remind you of the three broad perspectives because you're going to see them played out in the rest of this semester in everything you read. The first, generally the most conservative, the system will cure itself. Let the downturn go. That the system has built in its own recuperative mechanisms. If you recall, I gave you the medical metaphor. If your body gets sick, your body has chemical and other mechanisms to you know, white blood cells that attack the invading germs, all that kind of idea. So capitalism is metaphorically seen that way. So capitalism becomes a system that will cure itself. And to drive home the point, the conservatives say the government is a poor agent for ascertaining when the problem is about to hit. It is a poor judge of what's going on and when it enters it makes things worse. The government screws up. Not to put too fine a point on it. So therefore even if there's some distress when the cycle happens, when the crisis happens, it's better to let the system fix itself than to have the government called in because the government will make the problem worse. The liberal, as opposed to the conservative, in economics, the Keynesian, as opposed to the neoclassical dominant tradition, the Keynesian slash liberals are the ones who say, are you crazy? As the economy goes down, capitalism goes down, people lose their jobs, businesses go out of business. What? The suffering is dangerous. First of all, we shouldn't allow suffering in our society. Especially because, as you'll see, the suffering in economic downturns is never evenly distributed. Some people suffer a lot, and some people suffer none at all. There are people who make money out of downturns in a capitalist system. 
So there are people who react and say, no, 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 we cannot allow. That, is, that violates our politics, our ethics, our, our values. And those are liberals, typically. They want to get the government again into their suffering. Let me give you concrete examples. Why beat around the bush? There are people today saying, my God, people are losing their homes in foreclosures at a sleeping America. We must help these people. And then you get an image of people thrown out on the street with their mattresses around their feet, you know, and have no place to live. All of which is absolutely true. It's going on in large numbers. You're going to expect many more of these stories to happen here in New York for sure and elsewhere. So there are people who say you cannot let this downturn go because the suffering is impossible. A little hard, harder, hearted kind of version of this is not suffering, suffering, you know, okay, we shouldn't have suffering, that's not so important to these folks. What's important to them is the danger, the political, the social danger, that in a downturn there will be so many people suffering so much that they will get so angry that they don't want any more capitalism and they're not going to stand for it. In other words, these are people who, because of their upset and their suffering, are going to redistribute the wealth uh, right away by removing yours and acquiring it for themselves. By snatching yours, or burning your house down, or whatever. In other words, again, not to spend too much time at this point on it, there's a fear that the liberal cashes in on. He says, or she says to the conservative, it might be nice to let the system fix itself, but we don't know how long that's going to take. We don't know how many people are going to suffer along the way. We don't know how angry they're going to be, and we don't know the political direction their anger will take, and that's not a chance this system can afford to take. So you better bring the government in, even if it doesn't do such a good job, because the alternative is a lot worse. It's social revolution of one kind or another. And that argument gets played out over and over. It's being played out big time right now. To the left of Mr. Obama, best example, pick up today's New York Times. Mr. Paul Krugman has his usual, uh, you know, in the back there on the editorial op-ed page or whatever it is. There you'll see him from the left pushing Obama because what you're doing is not, he says to Obama, you're not doing enough government intervention and this system is going down because you're not acting enough. From the right, Mr. Obama is pummeled, not just by Republicans, for them, by them for sure, but also by a considerable number of Democrats, particular senators, saying it's too much, the government isn't it, we shouldn't, we can't. Just like Roosevelt before him has to work out which way he's going to go. And it's not clear. It's getting clearer, but it's not quite clear which way he's going to go. So this is, this is happening right now, and this has been going on just as capitalism oscillates back and forth. Every time there's a crisis, this argument begins. Typically, one side of the argument wins, and the other one loses. When the, when the people who say there must be intervention win, the state comes in. Over the last six months, those people have won. So the government has come in big time to save the situation. A year ago, there were almost as many people, not as many, but almost as many calling for the government to come in, but they weren't strong enough yet. Things hadn't gotten bad enough yet. So a year from today, the voice, Mr. Krugman looked all alone and wasn't as hard about this issue as he is today. And he wasn't listened to. And he was upset about it. That's why he was a big supporter of Obama, because he hoped that Obama would go much further in that direction than he ever imagined Bush would. You know, a reasonable presumption. Most people shared that presumption, whether they agreed or disagreed. So when those folks win who think the government should come in, it does. And when those folks lose, then the government is withdrawn, reduced, plays less of a role, pushed out. Every capitalist society, at least anyone I'm familiar with and anyone I've ever studied, displays these oscillations. And I, I call one phase private capitalism and the other one state capitalism. There are a lot of other words. Some people call private capitalism neoliberalism. You'll see that often. Some people call it laissez-faire. A lot of words over the time and in different circumstances have been used. But the basic idea is this. In one phase, the government's role is relatively less 
Please note relatively less, because the role of the government in a capitalist economy is everywhere enormous. Right? Just remember, governments print the money. No one else does. Nothing happens without the money, and nobody else is allowed to make that money, just the government. So the idea that the government is not central to a modern capitalist monetized economy is silly. Don't get caught up in the rhetoric so much that you really think, get the government off our backs. Not possible. Right? The government does much too much. The government controls interest rates. Not 100%, but is a major influence on interest rate. That's the terms on which anybody lends money to anybody else. They print the money, they control the, the terms of lending. The government is, if you take all the different levels of government together, by far the largest employer. The government is an immense buyer of an enormous number of things. You may not have noticed it, but you cannot buy a battleship. Only the government can do that. Well, the government's the sole buyer. Try to think of what the power is if you're the sole buyer of whole industries. You know, President Eisenhower was famous for worrying us about the military-industrial complex, he called it. That's because he was smart enough and honest enough as a president to say, you know, you've got a problem here. If the only buyer is the government and the profitability of major industries depends on it, they're going to get together to take care of each other's needs. And that's going to make a problem in our society, which he was absolutely right. It always has been. Okay, so the government is the, a major buyer of whole industries. The government is uh, the largest employer in the United States, therefore having an influence on wages and salaries. The government regulates everything, you know, from insurance rates to your utility bills to airline you know, activities and runs the post office, runs the major railroad. Whoa, the idea that the government is not central to our economy, and that's true of every other capitalist economy too, that's just silly. That's ideological junk and we don't have time for that. But the argument is real in the sense that given that the government plays a big role, it can play a still bigger one or a more muted one, and that's what this fight is over. When the economy turns down, that, the, that you should keep the government out of it, versus when the economy turns down, you should bring the government in big time. Keynesians, neoclassicals, conservatives, liberals. Have they in fact oscillated back and forth? Yes, I'm going to take three countries I could have taken any. I'm going to take three countries and I'm going to comment on the third world a little bit and show you concretely how this has worked. We we'll start with the United States, that's the country we're in. Uh, and I'm not going to deal with the 19th century, although I could. I'm just going to deal with the 20th. So until 1929, the United States was pretty much a private economic system. That is, there was the government there? Yes. But the government had a limited, marginal, restrained role. When the Great Depression hit in 1929, as you already we've talked about that, Roosevelt changed that. And from roughly the mid-1930s to the 1970s, we had a state interventionist capitalism. Right, the government came in and took money from business, for example. Took money from businesses and said, we're taking this money from you and we're going to give it to workers when they reach 65. What? That was a thought that would have been thought of as Bolshevik wildness a year earlier. But in the depths of the Depression, that was passed. And it has been unable to be touched by anybody. Poor Mr. Bush, two years ago, tried to go after Social Security. Can't do it. That's become something Americans, even conservative Americans, don't want to discuss, let alone have taken away. So from the 30s to the 70s, you had state intervention. Then in the 1970s, we had another switch. The, cap the state interventionist capitalism hit a terrible crisis in the 1970s. For those of you who know something about the history of New York, New York went bankrupt. It was kind of taken over by bankers and so forth for a while. And New York City went through quite a conniption in the middle 70s. Uh, and the country as a whole had one of its worst downturns since the Great Depression, 1974. And so out of that came, in the crisis of state capitalism, as it went down, the Keynesians, who had been in charge now for 30, 40 years, said, okay, we have to, we have to do something even more than we usually do. No, said the conservatives. On the contrary, the solution to this downturn is to go back to the private. 
And they, they won. They won. Reagan became president. And Reagan set about to undo all that had been done in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. He literally rolled back the New Deal. And he said that, so we don't have to guess about it. I mean, we, we would be entitled to make our own judgment anyway, but he also said it. And many of his advisors said it, made no bones about it. They felt that was necessary. And from the 70s to last year, that's what we had. And, and in case any of you think it, don't make the mistake, not just Republicans. Clinton did the same thing. There are debates about it. I don't want to make this all seem like it's all neat and packaged and everybody agrees. That's never true anyway. And now, it's, we're going back. Now, very quickly, remarkably quickly, from the crisis really hitting late in 2007 and into 2008, by now the state is massively moving back into, into controlling the United States government more than it has in a long time. We're, we're back into the level of the Great Depression in terms of the state moving in. It's extraordinary. Not in every way. Roosevelt, after all, responded, just to give you one example of what hasn't happened yet, Roosevelt responded to the crisis of the 1930s eventually by saying the following too many people are unemployed the private sector is not providing jobs and if the private sector cannot provide the jobs then the public sector must do it and he proceeded to hire millions of people okay I mean that's has to deal with that we haven't done that yet. Not only have we done it, but just a footnote. It's not even being discussed yet. Not yet. There has to be what? I mem mentioned you already last week. Something happened in the 1930s. Something was present that we don't have now. A communist party, a socialist party, and a really powerful labor movement that was on the upsurge. We have a very weak lo labor movement that, if, if anything, is on the... Is that a word? Downsurge? Downsurge. It's declining. And the socialist and communist parties, are, if they're there, are so weak as to be literally off the chart. So we don't have the pressure from below yet that probably is necessary to get the government to come in. I mean, just, just think, even though I, I'm jumping ahead. The government, which is now the lender of last resort, you know, lending to the banks when nobody else will, that concept, the government is the lender of last resort, is easily extendable to the government as the employer of last resort. Right? It's only, this is only a rhetorical question, a political question, when the one can become as naturally talked about as the other one already is. If you understand that context, then the sentence, the war is what finally got us out of the depression, is true in the sense that we've finally put all those unemployed people to work. I mean, they had jobs, either in the military or working for the military. But yes, 1945 is, is, is the cataclysm, the irony. All the, the war is over, the United States is on the winning side of the war. And now you demobilize is the word. You, you, you take all the people and put them out of uniform. You put them in uniform. You don't need them anymore. And they go home. Uh -huh. And then the great fear was we just came out of a depression that we could not get out of from 29 to 39. The war is over. The great fear. And go back and read the newspapers. You'll see that in everywhere. The great fear was we would fall back into the depression, which was a rational thing. Everybody understood. The war is now over. All these people have no work to do. There's no, there's no one to shoot at. So we're going to take millions. Remember, there were millions in the army. Millions are going to come home looking for work. Plus the millions who are no longer needed to make munitions. They're going to look for work. But there is no work. What could it be? How could we do? And the great urgency of 1945, 46, 47, 48 was a great struggle in the United States, a very tumultuous political period in our history, what to do. And it became dramatic because Roosevelt dies just at the beginning of that period, and he was the, remember, he was the president elected four times. That's why we have a law in the United States now that you can't be president more than twice, because there was so much upset that he had become, I don't know, let's say, a pick in a moderate um, metaphor, Hugo Chavez. Right? A person who stays. Or maybe I'd better pick Bloomberg, a person who stays, you know, <laughs> stays. Um, and people don't like that often. And uh, so Roosevelt was dead, and this, excuse me, but I'll, you know, to be colorful, this hick 
from the Midwest, Harry Truman, that no one ever heard of, sort of the federal version of Mr. Patterson, our governor, who became president, well, Patterson became president, uh, governor, because the other governor, dot, dot, dot. And so in that case, Roosevelt didn't do that, or at least we have no record of it, but he died, which has, if you see what happened to Spitzer, it's about the same. He vanishes, you know, it sort of vanishes, and uh, somebody else comes in, and he may be a good one or a bad one, but he kind of falls into this job when no one expected him to, and that's not a good person to have, and it's such a difficult moment in your society. And plus, the great alliance of the Second World War, some of you, your history may not remember this, so it's important to tell you. The great alliance of the Second World War was the alliance of the United States and the Soviet Union. And in American post offices across America, there was a big picture hanging over the door. Uncle Sam, arm in arm with Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe for Joseph. For Joseph Stalin. So when everybody in America, in little dipsy doodle Minnesota, bought a postage stamp, they had a beaming Stalin who looked down on them as they did it. Right? It's important that you understand that. So the Great Alliance was now the great conflict. Real quick, the two winners, big winners, went after each other. Uh, but there was a big difference. One winner had just dropped atomic bombs on people which made the other winner very frightened. The Soviets, if you ever look at the records, thought that the reason the United States dropped the bomb on Japan was to send the Russians a message. Whether that's true or not, no one will ever know. But the thought was enough. And so the Russians went to work to develop that own, their own atomic weapon, which they very quickly did. And were a very difficult time. Some of the worst strikes ever to strike American industry happened in 1947 and 48. The reaction of the business community was violent to these strikes. They passed, they got rammed through the Congress in a terror, something called the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which radically limits the power of unions, has ever since. It's the great hope of the unions today that Obama will undo that. Taft-Hartley rule. The most important part of the Taft-Hartley law, 1947, basically said two things. One, it is illegal for a communist to be the head or an elected official of a union. We hadn't done that before. Your political perspective disqualifies you from being the head of a union. And number two, anything won by a union in a contract, whether by striking or any other method, must be given to every worker at the worksite whether or not that worker is in the union and whether or not that worker joins the union and whether or not that worker pays dues to the union. In other words, it created for every worker the incentive to not join and not pay for the union since they were to get whatever the union got in any case. This is not good for unions, in case any of you have ever wondered about that. That is a very rough time and it had to do with the fear that we were going to slide back in to the Great Depression. So great was the fear that many things about our economy since, which we're going to talk about a little bit later when we explain how the crisis developed, come out of that time. So what happens in 1917 in Russia? Is there a revolution? Yes. Is it run by Marxists? Yes. Is it, are the big new leaders, Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky? Yes. Did they take pri private property away from the mass of people? No. Let me do that again. No. The mass of people in Russia in 1917 were farmers. 90 plus percent of the people were agrarian. The revolution took property away from the big landowners and distributed to the individual peasant family. And they kept that property for the next 10 years. 19, more than that, the next 12 years. From 1917 to 1929, the Soviet revolution guaranteed private property in land for the mass of people who had only land and nothing else. The notion that they took away private property is simply wrong. Even after 1929 when they had something called the collectivization of agriculture in Russia, the land was not taken by the state. Most of the land was given to something called collective farms, groups of farmers who owned the land privately. 
What the state took was industry, not agriculture. And agriculture was where the overwhelming majority of people were. So they allowed, by the way, each private farmer made his own decisions about what to produce and how to produce. The farms in Russia where most of the people were, were privately owned, private enterprises guaranteed by the Soviet government. And the reason the Soviet government survived Remember the revolution in 1917 is made by the Bolshevik party. That's a party of, you know, a few thousand people in a country of many millions. How was that possible? It was possible because they said to the mass of peasants, we gave you your land. We guarantee your land. If our revolution is overthrown, welcome back to serfdom. And the mass of peasants said, gotcha, we support the communists. You all know the history. I know you don't, but I'm going to pretend. You all know the history. 1917 is a revolution. Bolsheviks take power. 1918, with the active help of the Western capitalist countries, a civil war breaks out in Russia. A red army to support the government and a white army trying to overthrow them. Okay. In 1918, helping the white army the Soviet Union is invaded by armies from four countries. Britain, France on the west, Japan invades on the east, and one more country. What country do you think that might have been? The United States. 10,000 American troops land and invade Russia. Okay, so just footnote. The Uni I can see from your faces i got to do this. The United States invaded the communist Soviet Union. They never invaded us. So ask yourself, who's got what right to be afraid of whom in this history? Anyway, foreign troops helping the whites stayed until 1922. The revolution is in 1917. For five years at the beginning, this new fledgling government is faced with a world war, World War I, that it basically lost. It's the loser at the time the war is over. A civil war, a foreign invasion from the four most powerful countries in the world. It beats them all. Which, by the way, surprised Lenin and Stalin at least as much as everybody else. And it did that because it had the support of the peasantry. Very important for you to understand. So it's not what you might think it was. It's a kind of state capitalism where the state takes a tremendous role more than anything that happened in Roosevelt's America. But you know what the big difference was? In Roosevelt's America, uh, the government controlled industry, did this social security, started unemployment compensation, never had that before, and all that. But what the United States state never did is it never took over industries. It robbed the industries of many of their private decisions. You mentioned earlier, correctly, during the war, rationing. Again, just to make sure you all know. What is rationing? Rationing is when the government says, we are not going to use markets anymore as the mechanism of distribution. A market means the person who gets the tomatoes is the person who offers the most money for the tomatoes. That's what a market does. So if there's more people who want tomatoes and have money, then there are tomatoes to satisfy the demand. Then the people with the money begin to bid up the price of the tomatoes. So I offer $8. You offer $9. We keep on going until I drop out because I'm not going to pay that much. So the tomatoes go to the person who stays the longest and offers the most. So a market is a way of distributing goods to those most able to pay. When a government decides that it doesn't want the market anymore, as the United States government did in World War II, it sets up a system called rationing. Here's how rationing works. The government prints little pieces of paper. They're called ration tickets or ration coupons. And it distributes them to people, which is what the United States government does. Many other countries have done that too. And it distributes them according to some standard. Here in America, the standard was how many people are in your family. What are their ages? Stuff like that. And so you get a number of tickets. And here the law then becomes the following. A store can sell you a pound of sugar, a quart of milk, you know, whatever, a gallon of gasoline or whatever. And you have to pay with two, th two objects. You have to give money, like you always did, 
and you have to give a ration ticket entitling you to a gallon of gas or a quarter milk or a pound of sugar or 50 grams of meat or whatever it is. Either one by itself, you don't get the object. And a store who sells you the object without the two is going to be arrested. It's a crime. Wow. That means that goods get distributed not only according to the amount of money you have, but to according to some government idea of how distribution ought to be done, say by age or family size or whatever criteria they use. That's a government that is uh, abrogating markets. That's a government that is in truth. So the, the, the government under Roosevelt did those things and many more. But it never took the industry. It never basically said, okay, we're not just going to regulate you, control you, limit you, take this decision away from you. We're taking another step. Bye-bye. You're gone. And instead of the, the board of directors elected by the shareholders, which is how corporations work, the board of directors is elected by the government and put in its job. The board of directors becomes a government official, a set of government officials. That's what the Soviet Union did. It told the private directors, go away. By the way, when that didn't work, after a few years, Lenin, when he was still up, brings them back. Asks them to come back from where they had run away to Europe. And they many of them, millions of them came back. And he said, okay, I'm going to make you a state official and put you back on the board that you were on before as a private person. And many of them came back. because They were Russians, they felt at home there, they went home. But it really was a kind of state intervention and it certainly didn't change the organization of the factory and of the enterprise. The workers who had come to work before 17 worked real hard, produced profit that a board of directors got. After the revolution, they came all day, they worked real hard, and the profits went to a group of state officials. The workers had no more to do with the one than with the other. This was not a fundamental change. The workers didn't take over. Nothing of the sort happened. Then in 1989, what did Russia do? It did exactly what we've already seen. It oscillated back the other way. There was a crisis in their state-controlled economy. It had built up over the 70s and 80s, and by the end of the 1980s, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, the whole story, and that came to an end, and we went back to a government withdrawal. The government now privatizes. The government has made private what used to be government enterprises all over Russia. The government regulates less. The government intervenes. It's exactly the same story. Germany. Interesting, because it'll give you a wrinkle that the other, the other two don't. Private to 1933. In 1933, the Great Depression hits Germany in 1929, just like it does in the United States. And the economy goes into a terrible tailspin, massive unemployment, but they have not only got strong trade unions in Germany already at that time. They had an extremely powerful socialist and an extremely powerful communist party. Together the socialists and the communists were getting half the votes in national elections. So we're talking very powerful. So the business community, seeing the economy collapse, seeing the unemployment going crazy in Germany, says to itself, A, our system is falling apart. B, we have real contestants for power from the left. Way more powerful in their society than the left in America was at that time, for example. Or the left in Britain or the left in France. The left in Germany was the most powerful and most organized at that time. So the business community was freaked out. And they understood real quickly that the only way they were going to save themselves. And remember, in Germany, you can't forget in 1933 that it's really only a couple of hours by train from the Russian-Soviet border. It's not America, it's not a big ocean, it's not a long trip. It's real nearby. So they were freaked out. So they had to very quickly find a social force that could rival the strength of the left and squash them. And a little guy with a black mustache and funny hair said, I'm the guy. I can do it. You give me power, 1932, December, in Germany, Adolf Hitler, you give me power, and I'll take care of the left. They gave him power, and he took care of the left. 
and he set up a state capitalism. State took over massively. But you who, some of you, who might think that when the state takes over, it's always the left version, uh uh-uh. Doesn't have to be. It can be a right-wing version. Hitler was, the state is going to take over, the state is going to get us out of the horrors of the Depression, which he did. Did he put the German workers back to work? He did. He did. He did it around rebuilding Germany. He also did it around taking over the rest of Europe, or at least trying to. He rebuilt the military that had been defeated in World War One. He did all that. Gave the Germans this sense of purpose, Third Reich, you've all seen the movies late at night. So the state takes over. You have a state kind of capitalism. And it works until Hitler is defeated, 1945. And then an interesting thing happens. You have a crisis. Germany loses the Second World War in 30 years. Hey, that's uh, not good. Wiped out country. Wiped out physically, wiped out industrially, wiped out psychologically, wiped. So the idea then to give it back to the private sector made no sense because there was no private sector. It was, it, was, it was done. So another kind of state capitalism happened, but it went from a right-wing state capitalism to a sort of liberally state capitalism. The state helped everything. The state had to. But it wasn't any more fascistic. It wasn't right-wing. It was sort of mildly left. Nothing like Russia. Not even like FDR. The great man who pulled this together in Germany, a man named Konrad Adenauer. If you ever study the history, interesting man. And so Germany, from 45 to 95, 50 years of rebuilding itself into a powerhouse economy with heavy state involvement. Footnote, examples. What do I mean by heavy state involvement? Let me give you some examples. Uh... Hitler decided that one of the ways to put people back to work is to produce automobiles. And he wanted to produce automobiles for all Germans. A radical idea in 1933. The majority of people had no car in any country. Certainly not this one. But the only way to do that, of course, he thought, he was a state guy. We might nowadays call him a Keynesian. And we should. His, his, his finance minister, a very famous man named Hjalmar Schacht, was a Keynes, if you read his work, it's Keynes in economics. In any case, he decided to build a people's car. And the way you say people's car in German is Volkswagen. Wagen is car, Volk is people. Volks, car of the people. So the car of the people, and Adenauer stayed right with it. It was a government, it only became private decades later. It's a government car industry. The government, of course, does that. Just like in France, the basic car that became the mass car is the Renault, which is still owned by the government in France to a large extent. Not, they're not the sole owners anymore, but they used to be. So you had a, a right-wing state capitalism fade into a left of center. Wouldn't want to call it leftism. And then in 1995, they made the transition to private. And for the last 15 or whatever it is, years, 12 years, And now as the crisis is overwhelming Germany, the same one that's overwhelming us, they're making the transition back to state. And again, it's the Adenauer type. The the transition back to state is a peculiar German political leader, a woman, Angela Merkel, whose political formation was as a communist official in East Germany, that's what she comes from, who became deeply Christian when it was politically useful. What? and relatively conservative, but not all that much. She's again that peculiar German, she's very flexible. Her whole life is one of extraordinary flexibility. And she's now flexibility into the state because the private, short little period of kind of a private economy has been such a disaster. And now she's in trouble because as the country trends down, the left is getting stronger, fast in Germany, and she has to figure out how to do that. Over the last three or four days, you've been watching her move to the left in areas that are not yet too controversial. For those of you that are Roman Catholic, or that even if you're not, but you care about what the Pope says and doesn't, the Pope made a decision 
last week or whatever it was the week before to bring some bishops that had been pushed out of the church back into the church. And one of them, a bishop named Williamson, I think in, uh, not in America, British I believe, or Scottish or something, um, was wont to go around giving interviews around the world about how Jews weren't killed in the war and, and the anti-Holocaust and all that. And so the, the Pope, the Vatican gave out that the Pope wasn't aware of this at the time he made the decision and if you believe that I have a bridge I will sell you. But in any case, um, <laughs> He said it, and I certainly don't know one way or the other, but in any case, he said it, and Merkel went after him. And she has kept after him every day. She beats up on the She calls him on the phone with a full press in the room, and ber- was really amazing, you know, you don't have that very well, and berates the Pope, and has gotten him to move to adjust. The Pope, I think, has, has now demanded that this bishop uh, recant these things, and, uh, you know, he, it's amazing. And that's her positioning as she discovers that she's got to make the the shift back to state capitalism, which is difficult to do in any society, and requires very deft political maneuvering if you're going to survive in your career while making that transition. Last thing, in the third world, you have the same peculiar thing. In the colonial period, up to the end of Second World War, the government was involved in every colony. Governments controlled colonies. And the reasons the British government controlled the British Empire and the French the French and the Spanish the Spanish and so on was in order to make these colonies pay. It costs money to run a colony. You have to have troops stationed there in case the local folk don't like you. You have to uh, build some roads. You have to have some railroads. You You have to do stuff. You even have to invest some money to make them pay. But then you want them to produce the kind of things that will make your metropolitan economy work. So Britain, for example, uh, for those of you not familiar, Britain, the British society became wealthy and the British Empire became powerful around one fundamental industry. And that was textiles, cotton textiles. The British Empire produced the best at the time world's cotton cloth and the whole world was its place to sell this for clothing it wiped out all the local clothing producers all the local weavers all the local spinner all that was wiped out in one country after another as the British got everyone to wear cotton clothing which nobody had worn before the only problem was if the British Empire depended on selling cotton cloth You all understand, in order to make cotton cloth, you need cotton. And if you ever visit England, it'll take you about two to three seconds from someplace else. Now for a long while, the someplace else was here, the south. And the British had it all worked out. They gathered slaves from Africa, shipped them to the American south where they produced the cotton, which was shipped to the factories in England, which produced the cloth, which made the country rich. Notice, crucial to the rise of the British Empire's wealth are black slaves. Crucial to the rise of the American country's wealth, selling cotton to England was the same slaves. And you know how this society appreciates the work that was done by those slaves all along. So in England, they needed cotton. Well, when the United States became an independent country, and particularly after the Civil War, in which the allies of the British in the South were defeated, even though the British helped them, the British understood, ooh, ooh, these Americans are not our friends. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to start producing cotton themselves. They're going to take their own cotton, make their own cotton cloth, and we're going to be shafted. Solution, we got to get cotton out of our empire not from the United States. And so the British went to work and planted cotton in every single colony the British had. They tried it everywhere. Where it worked, the country became a cotton producer. And where it didn't, the country didn't. Uganda produces cotton because the British planted it there. Egypt produces cotton because the British planted it there. Tanganyika, what's now called Tanzania, they tried cotton, didn't go well. So. Tanganyika's history, Tanzania's history, is built around something else which the British could market, called coffee. Kenya coffee. Kenya Robusta coffee. Right? Sisal, tea, 
no cotton, cotton's in Uganda, etc. Okay, so the, in every colony, the government is playing a central role deciding what's produced, how it's produced, and everything else. With independence, 1945, immediately after the war, many of these countries became independent. Did they shift from a state capitalism to a private capitalism? No. They didn't have enough private capitalism. First of all, with independence, the Europeans that were there often withdrew. And the, the Africans or the Asians or whoever they were that were in the colony had not yet developed in most of these places. And even if they had developed an industry, for example in India they had, it still needed a lot of help in a world that was no longer protected as they, as they had been in the British Empire but was now an open market situation. So the government was called in. So in the early years, the early decades after 45, state capitalism of the colonial kind gave way to state capitalism of the independent kind. But again, by the 70s and 80s, when a crisis of that kind of capitalism hit, they all oscillated over. They all became private capitalists. Most famous example that you can read about was the famous shift in the government in Chile, in Latin America, where things had gotten to such a point that in response to the difficulties in the late 60s and 70s, the Chilean state capitalism moved to the left. Rather than a swing to the right, they moved to the left. They elected a socialist, Salvador Allende. And then he was promptly murdered with, it looks like, at least the United States is, what's the word I want? Benevolent involvement, let's call it, whatever that means. Um, and he was killed and thrown out, and in came two interesting groups that reshaped Chile. One was the military, a man named Pinochet, some of you read about, who became the dictator for many years, and what were called the Chicago Boys, Milton Friedman students who came into Chile and redesigned, got rid of state capitalism, which they hate. Well, they're on the other side of that debate, and they refixed Chile, and as they did with many governments in Latin America, to make them neoliberal. Open up the economy, let foreign investors come in, decontrol prices, make the government smaller, cut back, so all of that. And that didn't wait till 208. That already fell apart around this time. And Latin America, as these private capitalisms had harder and harder time, began the shift to the left. Evo Morales, Hugo Chavez, you know, you, if those of you pay attention, a whole movement that makes Latin America one of the most left-looking places in the world right now as it moves back into a state capitalism trying to cope uh, with the situation. So, we've had these oscillations. In each of these countries, the struggle between those who want the government in and those who want it out is rerun. Each country has its own unique way, its own traditions, its own culture, its own way of posing the problem, but they all pose the same problem. And always lurking on the edges of this debate is the third position, which is a pox on both of you. We're not interested. We are the, we're the Marxists, we're the socialists, we're the left. We're not interested in debating which kind of capitalism we're going to have. Because we watch this history. We know that whichever one we have, it'll hit a crisis after a while, because that's how capitalism is. And then we'll have an oscillation back to the other one. And meantime, it's just a different set of people who get screwed. Or if you're really unlucky, the same set of people get screwed with each one. And this is a system that has outlived its historical usefulness and needs to be replaced by something altogether different. And then they have different definitions of what that altogether different will be. They give it names like socialism, communism, and a whole bunch of other names. And they have quite varying notions of what this is. But they all mean it to be radically different, not just from private capitalism, but from state capitalism as well. They're not Keynesians. They don't want to enter that debate. And in some countries, they're very strong. In Bolivia now, for example, they're very strong. In, in Germany now, uh, there's a real struggle between the Keynesian types, who are still stronger, and the anti-Keynesian far left, which is rising fast and literally feeding off the defections from the old Keynesian types. We have a new political party there called the Die Linke, the left. There's a new party like it forming in France, which has takes an interesting name. I don't know how many of you pay attention, but this new, there are actually two new parties forming in, in, on the left in France, and they both take the name anti-capitalist party. 
what an interesting idea. It's as if they want to be real clear what their position is, so nobody has to worry or wonder. Because the word socialist, you know, has become kind of fuzzy. So they want to be real clear. And so, you know, the left, die Linke in Germany means the left, and the French are literally calling it le parti anti-capitaliste, the French anti-capitalist party. And uh, it's very interesting that yeah, the same is happening slowly in Italy and in some of the, in the local uh, Benelux countries and so forth. Meant by the term crisis, that we have a clear uh, sense of what the word economic crisis means as we will be using it and as you will see it referred to more or less of what I'm about to tell you is what is meant. Let's begin by two preliminary comments. First, a crisis in a capitalist system can and often does start in the most varied places. It can start anywhere. What makes it a crisis is not where it starts, but how far it spreads. In, in that, again, I can use the metaphor of disease. Having a rash on your elbow is a rash on your elbow. When it spreads to the, all the rest of your skin, it's become a crisis. It, now it's, you, something is going on that demands a kind of attention that the rash on your elbow by itself wouldn't have. So where can a crisis occur? Let me just give you some examples, and I you know, could spend an hour doing it. I won't. Uh, if exports drop, suppose the exports of a society suddenly drop. Either drop because nobody buys this stuff anymore, or drop in another sense. People still buy this stuff, but they won't give you any money for it. Some historical examples, real quick. Suppose in the United States, we had a new scare. You know the kind of scares we have these days. Think peanut butter. Right? But suppose it weren't peanut butter. Suppose it were coffee. Suppose tomorrow there's a front page headline across America. Eating coffee makes your hair fall out. Right? Suddenly an awful lot of people would find something else to drink quickly. Just like those of you that are peanut butter addicts hopefully have changed your ways. At least for a while. Uh, that would be, take a country like Colombia, uh, we have a b major crisis. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? You have just removed something their whole economy depends on. I, I understand some of you are aware that Colombia sells another product, but we're not going to discuss <laughs> that. We're going to focus on the coffee. Okay? Um, sometimes this kind of crisis can be an, become an object of foreign policy. After the, uh, Castro made his revolution in Cuba, the United States said we will no longer buy sugar. Cuba depended on the export of sugar. They depended on the export of sugar above all to the rich North American market. This was an intentional attempt to throw the economy into crisis in the hopes that that would get rid of, of Castro. So it didn't work. By the way, why? How did, how did Cuba solve the problem of the sudden loss of its export market on which it completely depended? Any of you know? Russia bought it. Notice, so here was a, an event, could have been a crisis. If Russia had not done that, for whatever reason, then Cuba, God knows what would have happened, and probably there'd be no Castro either. So something started, but it didn't necessarily spread. In this case, something else was done so that this thing, this rash in your arm, didn't become a rash on your whole body. This loss of it, but in another situation and in another country it could be a disaster. For example, I'll give you another one. Uh, Saudi Arabia is in trouble now, big trouble. Why? Because in a sense, in another sense, it lost its export market. Saudi Arabia depends on one thing. Just one. Not even one and a half. Just, just one. Oil. It sells oil. A year ago, what am I saying? Eight months ago, oil was $145 a barrel. Today, oil is $37 a barrel, whatever it's selling for today. But that's the order of a magnitude. That means Saudi Arabia is getting a whole hell of a lot less money for the oil. Plus, since they're trying to drive up the price of oil, Saudi Arabia has been cutting back on production. So they're selling less oil at a much reduced price. Saudi Arabia is in deep doo-doo. And their country is in trouble. Other examples. 
Uh, investments falls. Businesses don't see enough money to be made. They don't think there's enough profit to be made. They decide not to invest. If they decide not to invest, they don't hire people. They don't buy stuff. They don't, have, they don't expand the factory. And that can be a real problem. Consumers can do it. Suppose consumers decided, which by the way is going on now, that they needed to save more money, that we've just been spending too much money and that's how we got into this trouble, that's how my family has so much debt and that's why, so I'm going to, I'm going to save, I'm not going to, you know, maybe some of you have actually experienced that. You were going to stop at the Starbucks, you went by the Starbucks. You were going to go out to a restaurant, you decided you could make SpaghettiOs at home, right? Okay, so, well, that, that you multiply that by 300 million people, and that's a lot of restaurants that are going out of business in New York right now, which, in case you didn't know, it is the case. Thousands are, are, are collapsing in New York because they have no business. Everybody is staying home and making peanut butter sandwiches. Um, the uh, Another example, credit dries up. Suppose you have banks, for whatever reason, unwilling or unable to lend money into an economy that has become dependent on credit. People who need credit to buy things, businesses who need credit to keep going, if they don't, can't get the credit for whatever reason, crisis. Any of these things, and many more that I could name, can produce a crisis. If they happen, it won't necessarily produce a crisis. What will determine whether a bad event of any of the sorts I've described produces a crisis? Well, the answer is the market. Because the market is the mechanism that will determine whether a potential crisis becomes an actual crisis. Because the market spreads the problem. And you know that. If, for example, um, the consumers start saving, then businesses who suddenly can't sell as much, restaurants, for example, they go out of business. And when they go out of business, they say to the Mexican dishwasher they've employed, bye-bye, don't come to work on Monday. The Mexican dishwasher, who has no legal right to be in the United States, is now has no income anymore, is surrounded by other people, Mexican and non-Mexican, who are looking for the few jobs that there aren't anymore. So he's going to do two interesting things, this Mexican. A, earning no more money, he can't send money back to Mexico the way he had been doing for his family. Second biggest export of Mexico in the last 10 or 15 years has been remittances, money from Mexicans working in the United States sent home. He stops sending the money home, crisis number one now hits Mexico. They have no money. But that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is that Jose not only sends no money back, but he has no reason to stay in New York, which is very cold and wet. He wants to go back to Mexico, which at least isn't cold and wet. And he's closer to his family. So Mexico has two great disasters. The end of the remittances and the return of the people. Oh my God. To do what in Mexico? In a collapsing economy, because there's no remittances, all these people need work, which isn't there. Whoa. Hint. Mexico. Watch Mexico. It's going to blow up this semester. We'll be here to analyze it as it happens. But you now understand that the market mechanisms, what leads you to stop going to restaurants plunges Mexico into a disaster. Contributes to that. The market shifts, spreads, infects. Every time you hear somebody give a speech about the wonders of markets, and they have some wonderful properties, always remember, like with everything else, along with the good news, there's always some bad news. And it's very dangerous to pretend that it isn't there. Markets spread the infection of downturn. And if they spread it enough, which they often do, then you have a general crisis. But please keep in mind the difference between where a crisis starts and what a general crisis is. We're going to talk about a general crisis. It can start anywhere. So, for example, the one we're going to be talking about here started in the financial sector which has led an awful lot of people to say it's a financial crisis. No, it isn't. It is a crisis of this system. It happened to start there, true enough, and that's interesting and we have to pay attention to that. But it could have started anywhere and many crises have started other places. It's nothing all that important, really, about where it starts. And it is a big mistake 
to keep calling it with an adjective about where it started. It's really an attempt to keep it there, an attempt which has long since failed. It's everywhere now. Second thing is to understand the mechanism of the market spreading. How does that work? And for those of you who ever had any economics, what I'm about to say in English was said in your textbook at the time by this concept multiplier, which may have troubled you when you encountered it. But it's a real simple idea. Here's what it means. If, if A, could be anything, a firm, a person, spends less money on B, say decides to spend $100 less on B than he used to spend, you used to go buy this bar every week and you dropped a hundred dollars on drinks. Okay? Now you're upset so you're not going to the bar and you're not going to drop the hundred dollars. Okay? Does the impact of the economy stop with your no longer spending a hundred dollars? Answer, no. Because when you don't spend a hundred dollars on the bar, the absence of a hundred dollar income to the bar means they in turn don't spend money on their suppliers of liquor or their workers or their electric bill or whatever else they spend. So the impact of your withholding a hundred dollars is multiplied in terms of the economy as everybody else affected by your initial withdrawal of a hundred follows with withdrawals of their own, reductions of their own spending, which in turn hurt other people, you see the process of ramification. Of course, if you didn't have an, a market, you might want to insulate one part of the economy from the trauma of another. You might put the difficult sector into a kind of quarantine so it didn't affect everybody else. But in order to do that, you couldn't let the market work because the market spreads the infection. This is the argument of a critic of markets. So if it comes as a shock to you, that's because critical arguments about markets have been relatively underdone. And I want to correct the balance just a touch. It's a falling production of goods and services, literally less goods and services are produced. Think of it this way, a pretty sudden, where the word sudden is measured in months, not, you know, not hours or days, but months. Suddenly, over six months, nine months, 18 months, something like that, the, the production of goods and services not only doesn't go up, it, it's worse than that. It doesn't stop going up, it actually goes down. Less stuff is produced this year than last. That's a crisis. Technically, for those of you that are concerned, the government or the National Bureau of Economic Research measures these things. And if you have two successive quarters of a year, so six months, in which the total output as measured by the government of goods and services goes down, that's a recession. That's announced. And this, this current crisis, we had a very bizarre thing. The National Bureau of Economic Research officially announced a recession in the United States in December, if I recall, of this last year, 2008, but then did something very unusual. It announced in December 2008 that the recession had begun in December 2007, a year earlier, which was strange because normally there's not that big a gap. It might, and it did certainly lead an awful lot of commentators to say, the Republicans needed to postpone the official announcement of a recession because it would have hurt the chances they had already lost but didn't know it. In other words, you needed to push that back because the Republicans being in power would get the blame if a recession was publicly announced. We'll never know what the truth of it is. But something made a long delay, so everybody scratched their head. In the financial world that pays attention, scratched their head at this announcement that a year earlier something had happened, which somehow nobody found a way to, to figure out or report for 12 months. Right? So, the, By the way, if you read European newspapers, there's no debate. There was completely understood by every major newspaper, this was an attempt to undercut Obama's uh, campaign for president. So it's a cut. And it is expressed, it, is, it, it takes the following form. In some companies, it's simply an announcement, public announcement. We are reducing the output of whatever. We're making fewer shirts, or we're shipping fewer computers, or we're uh, 
closing the car factory for a month around New Year's because we can't unload the cars or all the different, you've heard them, uh, the, the terms. We're going on a holiday, we are cutting back, we are trimming, all kinds of words that are, they're all about the same thing, we're cutting. Sometimes it's, it's expressed in another way, bankruptcy. That's when a company is so impacted, sells so much f- less stuff that it can't survive as an enterprise. It's just not making enough money to pay the bills, to earn a profit, to keep the shareholders happy, and they declare bankruptcy. There's a legal procedure. You announce to the world you're going out of business. You fire your workers, you sell your inventory and your equipment, and it's over. And there's a variety of legal ways to have that happen. Another way it expresses itself is in something called mergers, or nowadays mergers and acquisitions. That's when a company that's on the verge of disaster, instead of declaring bankruptcy, cuts a deal to become part of another company. Company presumably in better shape than it's in. Or at least the combination is in better shape than each of the two have chances to survive on their own. So, for example, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Pfizer and Wyeth, two enormous pharmaceutical companies, decided to make a merger and so forth. But many smaller companies as well. Sometimes mergers are called consolidation. In the literature, it's the same word. It means the same thing. Other companies begin to do things very famous in a downturn. They start to cut corners. They're in trouble. They can't sell as much, so they got to try to recoup the profits they would have made if they could sell as much as they had hoped for by saving here or saving there. So a company that grinds peanuts in a machine uses the same machine that used to grind hamburger meat. Since the hamburger meat has organisms that thrive in the peanut culture, you die. But you die filled with skippy. Okay? So which is some sort of consolation, maybe. Uh, But corner cutting, you're going to see more and more. You cut on maintenance, you cut on extra personnel, you lay off another person over here, you you get one person to do what two used to do before. You do what you have to do because often the alternative is you're going out of business. And faced with that option, people will undertake things and take risks and chances they might not have under other circumstances. Um, Then there's a process which in the business world is called milking the cow. Not a very nice image, but here's what it means. It's when a board of directors pretty well understands that this company can't make it. It's uh, just the numbers are there. They're not going to make it. Uh, But they have another six months, nine months. So what happens in the six months, nine months, is that they stop running the company as a company that makes whatever, and they start running the company to make sure the board of directors comes away from this disaster in the best possible shape. So then that's when when they start giving themselves benefits, when they start doing things that will at least temporarily boost the shares, when they have stock options as part of their salary, so the shares will go up until the bad news breaks six months later, when the shares collapse to nothing and the shareholders are wiped out. In other words, they actually accelerate the decline of the company as they milk it for what it can do for them as a board of directors, which they happen to be in the position to do, because that's what a board of directors has the power to do, at least for a while. But for them, a while is all that's left. It's a little bit like the French Louis XIV, who says, après moi le déluge, after me comes the collapse. But after me is the key phrase there, not while I'm there. Okay. The next part of a crisis, beside a cutback, is what we've already talked about, the market spreading it. I sometimes call this, because it comes from the business literature, the spiral effect. You know, you have a company that's perfectly good shape, great job, great machinery, great product, but it sells to other companies that are impacted by one of these crisis mechanisms. Now think of it this way, banks stop lending. Your company doesn't have any problem because it doesn't borrow any money. It's a real solid, rock-solid company. They have no debts. 
but you sell to other people who are companies that have debts. So when the banks stop lending, these other companies are in trouble and they stop ordering from you. You're a fine company, your product is impeccable, you've done a wonderful job, you're out of business. It's important that you understand this because otherwise you'll be of the view that the people who die in an industry, the people who go out of business, are the inefficient ones. Not at all. You were, this was the most efficient company in the world, but it was selling to somebody who was impacted by that crisis mechanism and could not get out of it. And since the society is remarkably poor at explaining any of this, part of which is reflected, all due respect, in the way you're looking at me as I explain this, Right? This is this is stuff that you ought to know in the same way that you know that you know when it is raining, uh, go get an umbrella. Right? But people don't know this, so they will very likely interpret that the job they're losing is the animosity or the hatred or the jealousy or the meanness or the ethnic identity of the employer, as opposed to them. And now you will begin to see all kinds of social tensions you thought were long gone or buried or not virulent come up big and fast as people try to make sense of an economic phenomena using all kinds of other meaning systems as they try to understand it. And I'm not talking about people who are malevolent. That's how they understand. They're trying to figure this out and they're using things that are in their head that they've picked up. And if you don't give them a proper economic education, either because you don't have the institutions to do it or the ideological bias makes this something you don't discuss, like sex or something, then you leave people open. You know, like we say, you have sex ed so kids don't get on the playground an idea about things that are weird. So you want them to get the right information. Well, economics is, is really very similar. And the level of ignorance about economics, as I say, is, is I don't know any metaphor that would capture. Okay. When workers lose their job, let's make sure we all understand what that means. It's not just, we don't need you anymore, go home. It's also, and this goes also to the, the question from the back of the, the comment from uh, Tess in the back of the room, that, that this is important because the, who gets fired, who doesn't get hired, that's very varied and has very varied social effects. For example, here are some of the things that go into that very important decision. Who gets fired? One, something called seniority. And it means something like this. That there's some kind of rule or tendency, explicit or implicit, to, hire, uh, to fire those most recently hired. That somehow, the longer you've worked there, the more you're entitled not to be the first ones fired, to wait a little bit out of a sense of decency, a sense of age, or maybe even a union rule that says you gotta hire, you gotta fire uh, the people who were here the least amount of time before you hire the ones who were here a long amount of time and so on. Second kind of consideration, and these are not consistent, they clash. Second consideration. The employer would like to hire fire first those who are paid more, because you save more that way. You want to pay the person you you want to fire the fifty dollar an hour person before you fire the twenty dollar an hour person because for the same trauma firing, you're saving a lot more money. So that that, that often operates. To give you an example of how this is playing out right now either on grounds of seniority or on grounds of pay, I suspect it's the latter, but I haven't done the work to prove it, uh, in this crisis in the United States, there's a disproportionate number of males being fired. Reading the New York Times three days ago, some of you saw that front page story, that we're just on the verge of having a, a paid labor force that is majority female in the United States. We never had that before. Never in our history that the men are being fired much more than the women. And my suspicion is it has something to do with the wage, the, the salary disparity, that the men are a better deal to fire because they get paid more. Which has an irony and a historical <laughs> sarcasm to it that you really got to think about it's to appreciate. It's true in China today, too. Yes, I mean, 30 million in, in, in many places, in many places, I think you'll see this. Then there's another thing that happens that is often below the radar. A switch in a downturn from, uh, from full-time to part-time. Very important in the United States today. People who don't want a part-time job, they want a full-time job, but they're going on a part-time schedule because the employer says basically it's part-time or no time. And faced with what that means, you accept part-time because it's better than no time. 
So we now have people who are in a very new situation. They're still counted as employed in the statistics, so be very careful what you interpret statistics, but they are in fact involuntary part-time uh, laborers. Well, if you put all those together, then you discover that families in America now need to distribute falling incomes over more people. More people per family are not working, and those that are working are earning less money on average. So less money in each family household unit has to be distributed over more people. If there was ever a recipe for tensions exploding in already stressed families, there's a good one. Mother and father exhausted, children already alienated, all the problems we know, and now less money to be distributed over more people who need it. That is a recipe, as Tess said, for social trouble on a staggering scale. If you add to that that the American family that is now being asked to spread more, less money over more people is already a family whose level of debt that they have to repay and pay interest on is greater than ever before in our history. Uh, the recipe for tension, for difficulty, for crisis, just lurking, waiting to explode, doesn't take any big stretch of the thinking. Now the impact of a crisis on the government. How does the government get affected by all of this and then react back on it? Government. And I'm going to use the United States because I don't have time to show you all the variations. It's a little different in other societies, but we deal with the United States. First of all, most important, falling tax revenues. As businesses reduce or go out of business, as workers get lower incomes because they lose their jobs or they go from full-time to part-time, etc., they pay less income tax. The federal government relies on the income tax levied on business for a small percentage and on the mass of people for the large percentage of its income. So the minute you have anything like what we have now, government, federal government, loses key revenue on the income side. But that's not all. States in the United States rely especially on what are called expenditure taxes, the most important example of which is a sales tax. You all know that. That's when you buy something for you know, $100, some coat, and you notice the little extra $7, $8, whatever the hell it is, the sales tax. That's an expenditure tax because it's a tax you pay when you make expenditures. Okay. So since people are losing their jobs, since people are frightened, they're making less expenditures. Remember my joke before? You go buy the Starbucks rather than get the coffee. You don't stop at the bar on the way home. You don't go bowling. Whatever it is you don't do. Every time you don't do that, that's less money coming into the state. So the federal government is losing revenue from income tax reductions. The state governments are losing sales tax revenue. The local government. The biggest source of revenue for the local government is property tax. Tax on the value of land, buildings, and automobiles, and business inventories. All of those are going down. We have a housing crisis. The, you all read about it, the collapse of the price of housing. That means the assessed values of real estate are everywhere going down. The value of the land, the value of the building, whether it's a store, a home, or a factory, are going down. And that means the property tax that's levied on them is, re is bringing in less money, which means the federal government has less money, the state government has less money, and the local government. As they have less money, what is happening at the same time? A rising demand for services. Let's go with the federal government first and then the state and local. Our federal government has rising demands. It has very expensive wars. Our country fights wars far away. It would be so much better to fight a war, I don't know, Belize or Grenada or Cuba. It's close. It's cheap. We fight wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's as if we tried to find the furthest places away. You have to ship everything over there. You have to pay. It's very expensive. So we have very expensive wars. The government has to pay for that. Iraq costs a fortune. Afghanistan is starting to cost a fortune. And as you know, many political leaders want to do things in Iran and half a dozen other places that will cost even more. What else? Well, in a downturn, rising demand for welfare as people go on welfare since they lose their um, 
uh, benefits, they lose their job benefits and so on, they lose their income. Rising demands from Social Security, same argument. And of course, nowadays, all of this argument gets exaggerated by the bailouts, which are costing trillions of dollars that the federal government, as the federal government gets less, it's spending more than ever before. That is a recipe, as you'll see when we do this, for real trouble. In the same way that it would be for you. If you're taking in less and your outflow is exploding, uh, it's going to be a problem. On the state level, same thing. There are rising, in, in, in economic downturns, there are rising demands on the police, on the fire department. Just fire, for those of you not familiar with the ways of American business. When your business is in trouble, uh, there are two things you can do besides declare bankruptcy or close down or merge. You can have a fire. If you have a very nice insurance policy, it takes about five minutes with a pad and pencil for anyone, for example, I can do that for you if you like, to show you why a fire would be the much the better way to go. Of course, you couldn't start a fire because that's a crime. But if a fire started by itself and burnt your place down, okay, every fire department in America knows exactly what I'm talking about. They have a long history. All fire departments know this. All fire departments are now, in cities that are not idiotic, are beefing up their fire departments right now. They're putting more people in the fire departments on each fire team because they, they know that they're going to have not only more fire calls, but very dangerous because these are big, big institutions, stores and factories. That's very dangerous for firemen and women to go in there. Uh, so fire police, because there's more trouble in the society, is going up. Schools. Schools need more people. Why? Simple psychological fact. Dozens of studies to show it. When unemployment goes up, family tensions rise, and kids have more trouble in school. Because their mother's in trouble, or their father's in trouble, or their relationship is in trouble, or their marriage is in trouble, or the household is too crowded, or the household is too tense, and it shows up in the child's performance, the child's behavior problems, the child's psychological difficulties, the child's, you fill in the blank. Schools need more personnel, fire more personnel, police more personnel, medical benefits more personnel, and not to be unfair, prisons. Got to have a place to put the people who act up. This all costs more. So the state and local governments have to pay for these things because that's how it's handled in America. These are state and local responsibilities by and large. And so the state and local governments have to spend more when they're earning less. Impossible. And in America we have a law. The federal government can borrow money to pay for the business of running the government. State and local are not allowed in America. State and local governments cannot borrow for regular expenditure. State and local governments can only borrow for what are called capital projects, or building a school, or building a sewer system. They can't borrow for running the business. They can't borrow to pay police, or teachers, or anything like that. They can borrow to build a school, but not to run the school. That's the law in the United States. Other countries don't have that kind of rule, but we do, so that's a, a problem here. The result of this division, federal, state, and local, is you're going to see, you're already seeing it, tremendous struggle as each branch of government tries to get out of this impossible situation by lopping their problems off the other. Bloomberg will blame Patterson. Patterson will blame Bloomberg. Patterson and Bloomberg will have a news conference to blame Obama. Obama will have a news conference with Patterson to blame Bloomberg. I, Musical politicians, this is called. And you will see a lot of that because they're all in a terrible situation and they're all desperate and they're all hoping the other one bails them out of the difficulty. Why? Because their political careers will be op over. What is Mr. Bloomberg going to do? If he doesn't get help from Obama or Patterson or both, he's going to have to do two things here in New York. He's already announcing them, so I'm not making this up. He's either going to have to raise taxes interesting move. Everyone's in trouble. Everyone's freaking out. Everyone's having difficulty. And now he's going to hit you with taxes? Bye-bye, Mr. Bloomberg. No more mayor. Or, if he doesn't do that, he has to cut back expenditures. What's he going to do? He's now threatened. This is, he said it. He's going to uh, lay off 15,000 teachers. He's going to uh, raise by a buck or something like that the uh, subway fares. He's going to half a dozen other things. 
all terrible, and they're going to cause him all kinds of trouble and all kinds of grief. And he doesn't want to do any of these things because every single one of them is bad for him politically and for all his supporters. So what's he going to do? Right? He's now deciding which are the people it's least politically dangerous to screw. That's what he's doing. And if the mass of people are screwable, say, for example, through a rising subway fare, that's what you're going to get. If people mobilize against that, then he'll go screw somebody else. It's sort of the squeaky wheel idea. You know, whoever makes the least trouble, you whack them. That tends to be poor people, disorganized people, uh, ghetto neighborhoods, ghetto school. You know, you should know the story. It's very old in our culture. When the government cuts back, when the government does all these kinds of things, lay off people, cut back services, we then begin to see the feedback in a vicious cycle. For example, you raise the subway fare. What, what are you going to do? People are going to use the subway less. Even if they don't use it less, they're going to have less money to spend on everything else because they're paying money for the MTA. And by the way, what happens to the money you pay to the MTA? The MTA owes more money than, than Methuselah. So most of that goes to very rich people who lend money to the MTA. So you're taking money from the hands of many poor people who would spend it and giving it to the people who are wealthy and lend to the MDA who will not spend it because they don't, they're wealthy. They take their money and invest it. Which means buying what? MTA bonds. That's right. It's a circle. They become wealthier that way. But it's very bad for the economy. Very bad. Uh, second, when the federal government has to spend all this money as less taxes come in, we're going to do this more later, but I want you ready to see these relationships. How does the federal government get the money to pay for these bailouts? The one you're reading in the newspaper, $800 billion, give or take. Is tax coming money coming in less? And they're talking about one of the biggest spending programs in the history of the country. The way that's going to be handled is by borrowing. There is no other way. Taxes are going down. They have to spend a fortune. They have to borrow it. So the, go the federal government goes around borrowing. But here's what the federal government says. If you lend to us, we guarantee payment. We guarantee it. Everybody who has money to lend in the world says, Whoa, I'm not going to lend to the Acme fireplace factory. I got no guarantee. That's a nice man. But pfft, he goes out of business. He's not paying me. And I'm not even going to lend to GE. They're not going to pay me if they're in trouble. But if the United States government gives me the guarantee, that's the best investment I can make. So this is called in economics crowding out. The federal government becomes the borrower of the world. Everybody else is screwed out of credit. Yeah, but that's not good because the whole rest of the economy lives on credit. So no one is going to lend to the little business or the medium business or even the big business these days. They're all going to lend to the government. But that's a disaster. That makes the private economy worse so that what the government is doing will prove to be insufficient since the very thing the government is doing is making the problem worse that it's trying to solve. When you get into that situation in an economy, you are in deep troubles.